Department of Fish and Game. Dan's a fisheries biologist, and when he was at the Oregon, at Oregon State University in the 80s, he first started experimenting with beer, but I think it's been in the last 10 years that he's gotten more serious about it. He's a national beer judge. And Aaron Christ is a biometrician with Fish and Game, and he spent some time in Germany, and that's what got him hooked on brewing beer back in the 1980s, and he's also a certified beer judge, and I think our presenters will say more about some opportunities some of you may have if you ever wanted to take some more formal classes than just today and become a certified beer judge yourself. So I'm gonna turn it over to our three presenters and welcome you to the stage. There's a lot of other grains we can use, um, pr predominantly wheat, but also rye. It can have a specific flavor, oats, all sorts of stuff. Um, I'm really only going to focus on barley and the malting of barley, but all of these things can be malted and you can change the flavors that way. But it's a little less out of control whether you get to choose one of these, but we're just going to stick with barley for now. So there are three processes that we control, and that's malting kind of, sort of, and killing and mashing. And that's how the malt comes in with. So the goal of malting is really to create the necessary enzymes that can convert the starchy endosperm. Wow. <laughs> Basically, we have a little embryo, embryo at the bottom here, and all the rest of this is starches that are encapsulated in uh, cellulose. And so we need to get those starches to be sugars, and so we need to do some tricks to get one or the other. So we need to get the moisture up a high enough and a correct temperature, and it's going to soak for a long time in order to get the embryo actually activated because it's lying dormant. So the two main enzymes that I'm going to focus on, of course there's tons of stuff going on and we don't have hours to talk about it, it's just five, ten minutes, so cytase is really what unlocks those starches. It degrades the cellulose walls around the around the starches inside the endosperm. And then the amylase are used a little bit at this point, but really they come in down the road. So we'll just talk about those more later. Uh, we don't care about that. So this process that cytase goes through is really called, we call it modification. And so that takes about a week to get from one end to the other. Some malts are completely modified, some are not. and that, we won't talk about that, we'll just kind of gloss over. But the other thing is, on the bottom here it's days, you can't really see it, this is a span of a week, but after about four or five days, the diastatic power, or the amount of these amylase enzymes is increased. And that's really important for later on when we're actually doing the starch conversion. But what about the flavor? None of this has to do with flavor, does it? Well, okay. The amylase enzymes will have a lot to do with flavor, flavor later on. So the next part, is kilning. And the goal of kilning is kind of twofold. First, we want to stabilize the grains. If we're going to store it, you're not going to use it right away. You want to dry it down enough so the enzymes stop. But this is really where a lot of the big flavor and color modifications come. And kilning is two parts, drying phase. So you want to bring out a certain amount of moisture um, so that you can have the processes that you want to happen. Some want high moisture, some want low, but in general, 
Um, then the curing phase, we're applying heat, but we want to kill off the embryo because we don't want to end up with a stock of wheat, or I mean, a stock of barley, but we don't want to get it too hot so that we kill off all those enzymes. There are some malts that kill all the enzymes, but we don't use those as the, the major portion of our grain bill. But the biggest thing that happens in the killing, uh, the curing phase is we get all sorts of flavors. And we get those through caramelization, which are sugar and sugar, sugar on sugar reactions. And those are usually at a high temperature and a low moisture. And the other one is by creating these um, melanoidins through not mallard reactions, they forgot the I, Maillard reactions. So it's not a duck, it's a French guy's name. So a um, little correction there. So it was the wrong answer, but it didn't matter. So it wasn't, it wasn't necessary. So depending on if you have a high temperature or a low temperature uh, and a high moisture or a low moisture, you can get different different flavors. So high temp and low moisture, you get toasty and biscuity. Low temp and high moisture, you get malty and bready flavors. So let's start looking a little bit at caramelization. Or maybe let's not. <laughs> how about, how about melanoid production through Maillard reaction? Well, that's, that's even worse. Yeah, just, just remember, you get sugars, you get amino acids from proteins, you do some stuff. <laughs> and you get lots of flavors, and there's lots of stuff you can do, and you get lots of different flavors. This is how I thought most of my knowledge classes. So, what do we have? Some examples. Most grain is made with a pale malt or a base malt I mean, beer. Most beer is made with mostly pale malts, um, and there are lots of different kinds of pale malts. And yes, Dan is handing out a little, a little uh, cup with some uh, Pilsner malt. You can take a few pieces out and actually chew on it. I have a whole bunch, King Street was nice enough to give me a whole bunch of kinds of grains. I got 10 different ones here, so after the talk you can come try lots of different ones if you want. Just too much to send out in the crowd. So, pale malts are generally dried out, mostly very gently, because you don't want to impart a lot of that caramelization or melanoid production, and then at the end, heat it up enough so that the, the embryo is killed off, but not most of the enzymes. And if you have the darker malts, of course, what is dark malt? It's infinitely many things. They generally leave more moisture in higher temperatures in different phases. And of course, that's where the science of malting is, is to get the flavors that you want out of that. It all depends on those, those choices that you make. There's some special malts. Uh, crystal malt is kind of interesting because that's kept at a very moist stage. And you allow those amylase enzymes to fully convert the sugars I mean, fully convert the starches into sugars, and then, and that's within the kernel of grain, and then you heat it up enough so that you form the caramel, caramels off of the, out of that. Of course, there's kills off all the enzymes, so it, you can't use it for converting anything else, but that's okay. It adds a lot of flavor to the beers and a lot of color. And then you've got the roasted malt going out. There's also the roasted malt, which is dried out and it's then roasted at very high temperatures, as you see. Um, it's really strong, you probably only want to grab one or two of them because it's like chewing on coffee beans. It, it produces a lot of dark chocolate coffee flavors, roasty flavors, and you don't use very much of it in beers. If you did, you wouldn't be able to drink it. But for example, so the beers, if anybody has the flights, um, ones that focus on the, the pale malts would be the, the Hefeweizen, of course, is going to be a wheat malt and the Pilsner malt, so the very light malts. And then the amber, if you have the amber, that's going to have a little bit of the caramel malts and biscuit malts, as well as mostly base malts. And then if you look at the stout, that's going to have some of these highly roasted malts in it. So you can taste some of those flavors in the, the plate that you have in front of you. you chose, chose one of those. So finally, mashing. The goal of mashing is to finish getting all of these starches converted into sugars. Um, and this is really where the brewer's art comes into it. So, usually we don't just use one kind of malt when you're brewing beer. You have a base malt, and base malts themselves can have a wide array of flavors, but then onto those base malts, you add very specialty malts, or some of the crystal malts, caramel malts, to give you flavors. And so. This is, this is really the art that a brewer brings to it, the knowledge on, well, these are gonna give me this flavor in the end. So, 
if the malts weren't fully modified in the in the germination stage, in the malting stage, this is where that has to finish up. So there's still some enzymes in there that can do that. And then you also want to make sure that the starch is gelatinized, which basically means it allows the other enzymes to act upon them. And uh, and then the biggest thing that happens now is sacrification. And that's where these amylase enzymes that I talked about earlier, way back in the first slides. They, um, and which sugars that are produced kind of depends on the, which of those amylase enzymes you're looking at. They all produce various sugars, but predominantly the alpha amylase produces dextrose and maltose, the beta amylase, maltose and glucose. Now our control over choosing which one kind of does more than the other is really in the temperatures. If you look um, higher temperatures, you get the alpha amylase, so you produce more dextrose and maltose. Lower temperatures, beta amylase, maltose and glucose. Of course, on this chart here, you see it's, it's a wide range. I'm not even going to talk about pH. That's another, that's another one. There. But you can see there's kind of this sweet spot where they're both going on. Or you can go a little higher, a little lower. So it all depends. But what does that do for us? Well, if we mash at a higher temperature, we're going to produce more dextrins. And dextrins aren't available to the yeasts uh, as far as respiration and producing alcohol. And so they remain when the yeast is done. And what that does is it gives us a little more mouthfeel can make a little more residual sweetness, and it also, since it doesn't ferment, it can make for a, essentially a little lower alcohol beer. Not a lot, but a little bit. So, once this is done, we separate the spent grain from the sugar water that we created, and then it's on to the next step. <laughs>